John? Is Tom so right on the panel? Friday. So, uh, as you know, our speaker today is Dr. Panos Christakis, and I just want to give him a, a brief introduction to you all. Uh, he uh, actually completed his undergraduate in biology at Yale, where he carried on to uh, do his medical degree at the Yale University School of Medicine. Uh, of course, he's one of our own. He did his ophthalmology residency here in Toronto, and he followed that by a fellowship down at the National Eye Institute, and that was in medical retina. Uh, so he's joined our department and he's on staff at both uh, Toronto Western Hospital and the Kensington Eye Institute. And uh, his clinical and research interests include one, what, we, what he's going to speak about today, hydroxychloroquine induced retinal toxicity. And he's also got particular interests in macular telangiectasia and clinical trials in diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration. So welcome, Panos. And uh, I'll leave it to you to introduce the rest of your panelists. That sounds great. So uh, I'll do the, uh, before everyone speaks, I'll do the original, um, the official introductions. But just briefly, we have uh, Dr. Michael Easterbrook, uh, professor of ophthalmology uh, and expert in hydroxychloroquine induced retinal toxicity here with us, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Kevin Kane, who uh, is a professor of medicine uh, and director of tropical diseases at Toronto uh, General Hospital uh, and co-PI of the hydroxychloroquine HERO trial looking at prophylactic hydroxychloroquine uh, to healthcare workers. Uh, and then we have Dr. <coughs> Simon Corrett, uh, who's a professor of medicine at uh, the University of Toronto, UHN, um, and head of uh, rheumatology, uh, the division of rheumatology at the University Health Network and Mount Sinai. So I'll start by just uh, loading up the slides. Can everyone see this? <clears throat> yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, so we'll start with the objectives. We'll uh, try and review the uh, screening guidelines, the most recent ones for patients that are on hydroxychloroquine. Uh, we'll talk about the clinical features and diagnostic testing that's consistent with hydroxychloroquine-induced uh, toxicity. Uh, and then we'll learn a little bit about the HERO hydroxychloroquine study from Dr. Kane. So in terms of the outline, we'll start with Dr. Coretta. It would be nice to hear a rheumatologist's perspective on hydroxychloroquine. Um, I'll go through some clinical cases, and then we'll hear from Dr. Easterbrook a few questions on, uh, on some pearls for toxicity. Uh, and then Dr. Kane will give us uh, an introduction to the study that's uh, commenced. Uh, then we'll go through a few more complex uh, cases. And then we'll have a time for question and answer. So if at any point people have any questions, you guys can post them in the chat and we'll, uh, um, at the end of the uh, talk, we'll go through them and you can address them to uh, the panelists. So let's start off by uh, just talking about what uh, type of healthcare provider you are. Uh, MD is going to launch a quick poll. Okay, so mostly ophthalmologists, as you guys can see. Some optometrists, some ophthalmic technicians, and some other healthcare providers. Okay, so I'm gonna start off by um, introducing Dr. Coret. Let me stop the screen share. So Dr. Simon Coret is a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto and head of the Division of Rheumatology at UHN in Mount Sinai. Uh, he's the director of the vasculitis clinic at Mount Sinai Hospital, which is the largest of its type uh, in Canada and one of the five sites of the vasculitis clinical research consortium funded by the NIH. His clinical and research interests include treating patients with complex vasculitis, including granulomatosis with polyangitis, uh, churg strauss polyarteritis nodosa, and Takayasu. We're fortunate to have Dr. Coret as part of the panel and look forward to hearing about his perspective on hydroxychloroquine for the treatment of rheumatologic diseases. Thank you, Dr. Coret, for being here. Thank you very much, Pano. Uh, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, by the way, have no room in, uh, for the management of uh, vasculitis. On the other hand, uh, they are among the most commonly prescribed drugs for patients with lupus. As a matter of fact, a colleague of mine in Ottawa used to define lupus as a hydroxychloroquine deficiency disease. This is how much we believe that this drug uh, 
uh, is an important part of our armamentarium for that disease. We also use it uh, with rheumatoid arthritis, although now with the, uh, we've got so many other alternatives, but it is still one of the three conventional DMARs that we use for the management of RA, the other ones being methotrexate, sulfasalazine, and uh, leflunamide. And there's another of other diseases where it's used, not as commonly, uh, diseases such as Sjogren's syndrome, for example, palindromic rheumatism, when, and so to main perhaps the, uh, the other two uh, that uh, we will consider that drug. You were asking me the, how does hydroxychloroquine work? In a nutshell, I don't think that we really know. There's a lot of hypotheses. It certainly work, well, delete this certainly. It's thought to be an anti-inflammatory. In lupus, we think that it uh, probably inhibits interferon alpha uh, as one of its main action. The, is it used in monotherapy or in combination? Uh, certainly in rheumatoid arthritis, it's often used in combination therapy. In lupus, uh, it is used for its uh, most uh, common and benign manifestations, that is the skin, the joints, the stomatitis, but it does not really have a major role for the major organ involvement, such as the brain or the kidneys or the hematological. On the other hand, another properties of uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, because by the way, hydroxychloroquine is used perhaps in 90% of instances as compared to chloroquine, which is now you know 10% or less. But some of the advantage of uh, hydroxychloroquine, in addition to its anti-inflammatory, perhaps disease-modifying component, is that uh, it has an anti. It's it's a mild anticoagulant whereby decreasing the adhesion of platelets and their aggregation, they may have a positive impact, and particularly in patients with lupus who are more prone to thromboses. Also has a potential impact in reducing the, uh, or improving the control of diabetes. And it also has a positive impact uh, with respect to lipids, where it decreases the uh, LDL and PLDL. Not so much any role shown for the HDL. So it's a drug that has multiple, multiple advantages. And yes, I'll end on that. Uh, rheumatologists in the world, we were all very concerned when the uh, you guys changed the, um, uh, the guidelines with respect to the dosage of hydroxychloroquine. As you know, it used to be a maximum of 6.5 milligrams per kilo, which was considered safe. Now that was based on the ideal body weight but uh, now the American uh, College of, the, the, uh, of Ophthalmologists is suggesting five milligrams per kilo as a maximum safe dose uh, for hydroxychloroquine and 2.3 milligrams per kilo for chloroquine. The good news, I think, is that we have, certainly I and the members of my division, we have adopted these, um, these recommendations, but uh, it was so hot two years ago when it came out that there was a huge debate at the American College of Rheumatology, which was quite interesting actually. Some rheumatologists being very, very nervous, especially the lupologists, about having to decrease the dosage of that medication. So I'll stop here because there's so much to uh, others to discuss. Thank you. That's great, thank you so much, Dr. Corrett. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, those guidelines and what exactly uh, motivated that change. So we'll start off with kind of why is it important to screen uh, patients because long-term hydroxychloroquine use can cause irreversible retinal toxicity. <clears throat> it usually affects the parafovia and spares the central vision until late in the disease, which is good in one sense, but bad in the other that early toxicity is usually asymptomatic. This is why it's in one of the diseases that's important to screen for and detect at this stage so that it can be stopped. When hydroxychloroquine toxicity occurs early and is stopped, um, it oftentimes does not progress and patients remain asymptomatic. And while there are definitely risk factors for toxicity, which we'll discuss, one cannot predict which patient will develop toxicity, which is another reason why uh, screening is important. So what's the pathogenesis of toxicity? Well, hydroxychloroquine binds to pigmented structures, melanin uh, being one in the RP, and it can accumulate. The thought is it can cause lysosomal damage and affect uh, the RP's ability to metabolize. Uh, and specifically, uh, the theory is that reduced phagocytic activity of shed photoreceptor outer segments 
results in their accumulation and then subsequent RP degeneration and photoreceptor loss. So the 2016 <clears throat> guidelines for screening uh, recommend a baseline exam. Uh, at this time, it's a good time to confirm and calculate the dose. Uh, you screen for pre-existing macular pathology, whether it's an epiretinal membrane, which can make screening more challenging, uh, macular degeneration and macular dystrophies. Um, it's a bit controversial. We don't quite know whether uh, they do predispose to toxicity. The theory is, is that if you have RP that's already vulnerable, um, that, that an insult like uh, hydroxychloroquine could potentially occur, uh, cause toxicity earlier and uh, more severe, as well as it confounds screening because it's hard to tell. And we'll give a few, go through a case uh, that uh, illustrates this point. In terms of risk factors for toxicity, renal disease was definitely um, uh, identified as one, as well as uh, concomitant tamoxifen use. Uh, hydroxychloroquine is uh, metabolized by the liver and uh, excreted through the kidneys. Uh, so uh, it's important to always ask about systemic diseases and uh, ask those specific questions to your patients. And then after five years, uh, they recommend annual exams. So uh, they don't recommend screening in the first five years because if a patient's properly dosed without any risk factors, uh, the risk of toxicity is less than 1%. Now, of course, if a patient is on a dose greater than five milligrams per kilo per day of actual body weight or has any risk factors, uh, as we described, it may be worthwhile uh, seeing them before the five years. So... Uh, this is a, a, a picture of kind of the, uh, the anatomic uh, structures that are affected in hydroxychloroquine. You can see the fovea, the parafovea, the macula illustrated there. Um, between the, the blue and the green circle, that blue area is the parafovea, which is affected. And as we know, uh, hydroxychloroquine affects the outer retina and the photoreceptors uh, and the RPE. So I don't know if you guys can see this laser pointer, but this is the areas that are affected uh, first in hydroxychloroquine toxicity. So we'll go through the first case. So this is a, these are all kind of real cases that I've seen in the last two years. Um, it's a 65-year-old uh, gentleman who actually astutely noticed that he loses mouse cursor. Uh, he was uh, he has sarcoidosis and rheumatoid arthritis and had been on hydroxychloroquine um, for many years, uh, 12 years of uh, 400 milligrams, uh, and then uh, a few years at 600 milligrams per day. Uh, so his dose initially was 6.7 milligrams per kilo per day actual body weight. Um, he was a non-smoker, uh, no other significant uh, health history. He was 20-20 um, and uh, he was a six foot three gentleman, 90 kilograms. This is a, a fundus photo of his right eye. You could see here that there are some uh, RPE changes uh, here uh, in the uh, parafovea. Otherwise, looks pretty unremarkable. On autofluorescence, you could see some hypoautofluorescence in that corresponding area. Interestingly, this, is, uh, this presentation is not a common uh, uh, appearance of uh, changes related to hydroxychloroquine, and, and the contralateral eye uh, is, is normal clinically with a normal autofluorescence. Um, so I think that this is one reason why baseline exams are important. There are other uh, diseases such as central serous core retinopathy when, when resolved can result in RP changes and similar appearances on the OCT. So if you don't have a baseline to go by, then it really makes uh, at five, when the patient comes in for their five-year visit and you see something, it's very difficult to know was this pre-existing or not. Um, so when we look at his OCT, here between uh, the red arrows, you can see that uh, if you follow over the outer, uh, the photoreceptor layer and the RP layer, you see here that there's a loss between these two uh, um, arrows. And even when we look at the other side, it's very subtle, but you see almost a little granularity of uh, that area. When we look at the contralateral eye, again, between these red arrows, uh, we see uh, areas where the RP photoreceptor complex uh, is quite attenuated. You see that loss there. You see this double line here that's lost and then uh, reconstitutes as you go more peripherally. And then again, when you look at this other side, again, I'm just pointing this out because it is subtle, but you do see a little bit of granularity in this area. These are his uh, visual fields, they were reliable. Um, and you can see here that there's a, a paracentral uh, uh, visual field defect, um, which is actually quite deep if you look at the, uh, uh, the deviation there. And in the contralateral eye, you see similar uh, paraf uh, paraphobial kind of comma-shaped uh, defect, visual field defect. 
So this patient had uh, multifocal ERG testing, which tests uh, different areas of the macula. And these are the waveforms here. And what you can see is, is if you look at the three areas and you look at the waveform centrally, and you see that here in this blue area, the, the, in the uh, parafovia, there's attenuation both in, in the amplitude of the responses. Uh, so there are specific multifocal ERG criteria um, that could be uh, suggestive of uh, toxicity. And one of them is looking at ring ratios. So uh, different rings are created uh, using the ERG where they're looking at how far they are from the central fovea. And the second ring, which is the area that is in the paraphobia, tends to be more affected. The amplitudes tend to be less um, in hydroxychloroquine toxicity compared to other rings. And there's a variety of different uh, um, ratios that could be compared. Uh, the one I would say is most commonly used is looking at R1 to R2 ratio, so looking centrally to the paraphobia. And if the uh, paraphobia is affected, then that ratio will be higher than 2.5. So in this patient, this is his other eye, uh, not as affected, but again, you can see some attenuation uh, of the amplitude of the responses in the paraphobia. So this patient has early to moderate hydrochloroquine toxicity. So he has RP changes in the right eye. Again, I don't think that those are characteristic. And they were actually found in the nasal paraphobia, whereas on OCT, you saw in the temporal paraphobia is where uh, he had uh, more ISOS loss and RP loss. Uh, the autofluorescence was normal. Uh, the OCT showed that photoreceptor loss. He had paracentral scotomas on the field, um, and that ratio, ring ratio on multifocal ERG was greater than 2.5. So these are all consistent uh, with hydroxychloroquine toxicity. And, and uh, the thought of, of detecting it with a bullseye maculopathy has long been debunked. That's much, much too late. At that point, uh, significant structural and functional damage has occurred. So the guidelines in 2016 were revised, and we'll go through that. So Initially, uh, uh, ideal body weight was used, and there are different nomograms to calculate ideal body weight, which use a patient's height and their gender. And the target, as Dr. Kret uh, alluded to, was 6.5 milligrams per kilo per day. Um, so if a patient was uh, overweight, they'd be dosed based on what their ideal body weight would be. New guidelines uh, suggest that actual body weight may be a better predictor of, tox of toxicity with uh, a cutoff of less than five milligrams per kilo per day. So the guidelines are a little different in that five milligrams was the absolute body weight as opposed to 6.5 for the ideal body weight. Um, and this becomes significant in certain phenotypes and we'll talk more about this. Um, hydroxychloroquine comes in 200 milligram tabs. The most common dose uh, from a rheumatologic perspective is 400 milligrams a day. So patients pay, take two pills per day. Um, but given the uh, absolute body weight dosing, anyone weighing more than 80 kilograms will by definition be over that five milligram per kilo per day. So uh, people are often on two pills certain days and one pill other days. And we'll uh, start by just a quick audience poll asking, do people with the new guidelines, do they still uh, use the ideal body weight dosing or the real body weight dosing, or does it depend on the clinical scenario? Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks panel. So we've got the poll running. We'll give it another 10 seconds or so to get some results in here. But it does seem to be pretty weighted to one direction. So I'm just gonna pause it here and share the results with you. So 81% real body weight using the AO guidelines. 15% of people are uh, saying it depends on the clinical scenario. And uh, I know both uh, Dr. Easterbrook and myself are in that category. And then ideal body weight, uh, some people are using. Uh, there were very low rates of toxicity prior to the change. And so, um, as Dr. Kretz said, a lot of lupus specialists where, where our patients are stable on higher doses may consider continuing to use that. So I think all three are reasonable. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, that now. So. If you have a patient who's five foot five, weighs 140 pounds, pretty close to their ideal body weight of 127 pounds, and they're on 300 milligrams a day, which is alternating 400 and 200 milligram doses, uh, they're dosed at 4.7 milligrams per kilo per day for their uh, absolute body weight and 5.2 milligrams per kilo per day for their ideal body weight. So regardless of which uh, you use, it's not very different for a patient that is of normal height and at their ideal body weight. We contrast that to a patient who is five foot two and weighs 180 pounds, that's on uh, 400 milligrams a day. From an absolute body weight perspective, looks like they're pretty good. They're at 4.9 milligrams per kilo per day, but considering their ideal body weight's 110 uh, pounds, uh, 
eight milligrams per kilo per day is what their ideal body weight dosing is on, which is significantly more than the 6.5, which was used previously. So you can see that body habitus really makes a difference and short patients that are obese are at much higher risk because they're overdosed. Um, and the thought is that hydroxychloroquine does not deposit in fat tissue. So these patients uh, uh, could uh, be at higher risk of toxicity as a result of that. So uh, when it came to looking at whether to, which formula to use in patients that are at the uh, spectra at the you know extremes of a body habitus, I think it's important to calculate both absolute body weight and ideal body weight, and then uh, make sure that they're at least not overdosed on the 6.5 milligrams per kilo per day. So how do you calculate the optimum dose? And I do this on every patient. It's actually quite easy. You take the uh, you calculate the number of pills per week. So you look at the five milligrams per kilo per day, multiply it by their weight, divide by seven, and then each pill is 200 uh, milligrams. So the patient's 60 kilos, you multiply that by five, seven days a week, divide by 200, they're at 10.5 pills per week. So they could take one pill per day and two pills on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and they'll be under just under that five milligrams per kilo per day. Um, and I think it is important to do because if a, when we look at the graphs, the difference between being dosed uh, below five and above five, uh, between five and six is a, a pretty big difference. Of course, speak to the rheumatologist prior to changing the dose. Uh, none of these are urgent things. Uh, you should talk and get their opinion as to whether their rheumatologic condition, there may be a reason why they're on a higher dose. If their disease was refractory to a lower dose, it's always very important to speak to the rheumatologist and to get their opinion uh, on whether a, a dose adjustment would be warranted. So this was a study I think that changed kind of how we think about toxicity. Uh, it was a retrospective case control study of uh, 3.4 million people um, and uh, 2,361 people were identified with uh, hydroxychloroquine use more than five years and had both visual field and OCT. The overall prevalence of hydroxychloroquine toxicity in any form was 7.5%, um, which to me actually seems much, much higher than what, what I would expect. And I think that that leads us to believe there may be a selection bias in terms of uh, which patients were seen um, and as well as with the grading. Uh, it was dose dependent. So people over five milligrams per kilo per day had an odds ratio of 5.7. Uh, the duration of treatment more than 10 years was a significant risk factor with an odds ratio of 3.2. Kidney disease was uh, also had an odds ratio of 2.1. It's excreted through the kidneys. You probably have higher circulating levels um, with uh, uh, reduced renal function. And then tamoxifen use. So tamoxifen, as we know, can be uh, independently affect uh, the retina. And so when used with hydroxychloroquine, there was a significant increase in risk of toxicity. So this is a graph, there's one graph uh, to, to look at, it's this one. So when you look at uh, five years, there's a 0% risk if they're uh, dosed under uh, four milligrams per kilo per day. I have looked through isolated case reports of toxicity before five years. And one interesting thing that I find is that uh, all the patients did not have objective uh, measures of, uh, of screening at their baseline exam. So I, th I wonder whether uh, certain macular uh, issues were missed at baseline and then were determined later on. I mean, they've reported toxicity as early as three months on a dose of less than five milligrams per kilo per day, which again, that'd be a very idiosyncratic, uh, rare uh, thing to occur. Uh, when looking at 10 years, the risk is 1%, 2%, 9% respectively for the different uh, uh, um, amounts. Obviously, 9% uh, being the five milligrams per kilo per day over that. And then between four and five, it's 2%, and less than four milligrams, it's less than 1%. And it's an increasing dose. And so at 20 years, uh, they say that even if you're dosed at between four and five milligrams per kilo per day, uh, that a quarter of people will have some evidence of toxicity. Again, this to me uh, doesn't make sense. I think it's much, much greater than what we see uh, uh, clinically. Uh, I've spoke with Dr. Kred about this, who has over 20 years of experience and can count on one hand the total number of patients that he's had that ha have had true toxicity. Uh, I've spoke with Dr. Easterbrook, who agrees, and we'll hear more about his opinion in just a few minutes. So in terms of screening tests, they recommend one structural and one functional test annually after five years. Often these tests, I'd recommend getting one at baseline uh, just to have to compare to, especially if they have subtle change on OCT, like uh, some change in the uh, outer retina as a result of prior CSR. Uh, it would be nice, or some small droop, some fine drusen. Uh, it would be important to be able to see those for comparisons purposes. Uh, 
Uh, OCT uh, spectral domain is an objective structural test. Visual fields is a, a, a subjective functional test. Um, it does re require reliable patients, so oftentimes it does need to be repeated. Um, traditionally, 10 uh, 2s were used, but uh, this study showed that in some Asian patients, toxicity and retinal changes can occur outside of the uh, central macula near the arcades, and so they recommend a 24-2 or 30-2 for those patients. Fundus autofluorescence, used more as a confirmatory tool, but is an objective structural test. Uh, the most common thing to see is hyper autofluorescence in the paraphobia in the earliest signs, and then as the disease progresses, it becomes hypo autofluorescent as that uh, sick RP uh, starts to function uh, less well. Multifocal ERG is uh, an objective functional test thought to be extremely sensitive uh, for the detection of hydroxychloroquine toxicity, but unfortunately, I don't think is as available uh, uh, as a lot of the other tests, but is, is very good for confirm confirming the diagnosis. Things that they don't recommend is fundus photography, uh, an answer grid, and color vision testing, which previously were, uh, um, were listed as tests. So this what I found interesting. Uh, you can see here, these are, uh, this is an Asian patient that's exhibiting hydroxychloroquine toxicity uh, outside of what is traditionally the, the area that's affected. So you can see here on the, uh, on the visual field, you see um, these uh, para, these are, this is a 30-2. So you can see that this is, you know, eight to 10 degrees out from the center uh, is where it starts and progresses out. You can see this hyper autofluorescence, the circumlinear area of hyper autofluorescence infrotemporally. And here where you see this blue area, you can see a, an abrupt loss of the, uh, uh, the ellipsoid zone, the photoreceptor RP uh, uh, area. And, and it's all confirmed on this uh, uh, multifocal ERG. So it's interesting that Asians uh, uh, have a predisposition to developing toxicity outside of the uh, central, uh, uh, you know, 10 degrees. And it makes it important to order a, a visual field which can detect this um, for these patients. So at this point, I'd like to take a second to just have Dr. Uh, Easterbrook uh, speak to us just a little bit uh, about his pearls from over 25 years of experience. Um, I'm going to stop the screen share and if we could pull up uh, Dr. Easterbrook as I do his introduction. Uh, so Dr. Easterbrook is a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Toronto and on staff at St. Michael's Hospital and Toronto Western Hospital where he does clinics. Uh, Dr. Easterbrook uh, pursued a uveitis fellowship at the Proctor Institute in San Francisco and became a world leader in uh, the field of hydroxychloroquine induced retinal toxicity. He was integral in establishing the first guidelines on how to screen and dose hydroxychloroquine through his work with the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Uh, Dr. Easterbrook has seen over 280 patients with toxicity, including 50 patients with, uh, on hydroxychloroquine alone. So we look forward to hearing uh, about Dr. Easterbrook's pearls on hydroxychloroquine induced retinal toxicity. And I'd like to start just by asking him about uh, what he thinks about the change between ideal body weight dosing and absolute body weight dosing in the uh, new 2016 AAO guidelines. Well, the old gu guidelines in 2002 and 2011 stressed the fact that these drugs are not absorbed by fat. In the 216, it, it, they also said it's absorbed by melanotic things, but not by fat. But the result was one line, it is, uh, corresponds with present practice. That's why we're going with five milligrams. And my concern, and many of us are concerned that uh, two thirds of women, according to NIH, are overweight or obese, and three quarters of men. And to give you an example, I had three patients in the last week I worked. They all were about 5'1, and they weighed between 190 and 200 pounds. If you do the calculations, the ideal body weight is, is 300 milligrams per day with the, the, the uh, present Academy uh, guidelines, those patients can take up to 440 milligrams. So I'm very concerned about these short, overweight patients, uh, and that is a real concern. So I think those patients should be based on ideal body weight. Excellent. Um, in, in looking at that graph, uh, those rates of toxicity in that 2014 Mellis and Marmor paper are quite high and much more than what I would expect. Uh, 
Uh, what is your experience in terms of the rates of toxicity after 20 years of use? Well, in the last six months, I've collected from my own patients, 117 patients who are on the drug and have been for 20 years. 10 of them were combination of chloroquine and then hydroxy and a couple were only chloroquine. Only two have been affected. And these are all patients with normal OCTs and normal visual fields. So the rheumatologists are unhappy with us because uh, the UK standard, which just came out two months ago, said the risk of retinopathy after 20 years is 30 to 50%. I don't believe that, and I don't think the rheumatologists believe that either, because they have many patients who've been on properly dosed patients who have not had toxicity at 20 years. So I think that's incorrect. Dr. Karat, do you agree? I fully agree. Yeah. Okay, uh, and then the last question I'd like to ask you, Dr. Easterbrook, is while multifocal ERG is not used for general screening, in what cases do you order multifocal ERG for your patients and, and how helpful do you find it? I find it a useful test. Uh, uh, a few years ago, we took 18 patients with definite bilateral retinopathy and we presented it to COS in Montreal. Eight, 17 of the 18 were positive with multifocal, only six of the 18 were present with autofluorescence and OCT, at least it, as it was done then. So I think it is a very sensitive test. And we we're doing some studies about that. The issue is you have a patient with a normal visual field and they have a pulse positive multifocal. What do you do with those patients? Because they have normal fields to start with. And we don't know when we are now doing studies, which uh, Panish you're gonna be involved in, whereas We've asked the rheumatologist to send us patients just before they put them on Plaquenil. So we can do a multifocal and then we'll determine the sensitivity and specificity of this. Excellent. Yeah. And there, there are definitely is some people that think that hydroxychloroquine may result in changes in the multifocal ERG independent of true toxicity and that it may never affect structural uh, function. Uh, so that is interesting to, to, to do a multifocal ERG before initiating therapy and then after to see whether these changes occur early and whether there are a reason to stop and how many may progress to uh, develop retinopathy. I've been to the uh, rounds at all the hospitals downtown. We've asked the rheumatologist to send us those patients and we guaranteed that we will see them within two weeks of the phone call. And then a multifocal can be done, and then the patient can start the drug. Okay. All right. So we're going to go back to the presentation and and um, just here. and and go through another case. So uh, this is a 49 year old lady who was referred uh, for hydroxychloroquine mm -hmm. screening, uh, second opinion by her optometrist. Uh, she was a myope, uh, uh, has lupus, and has been on dialysis for three years. But prior to that. Um, had uh, uh, reduced renal function. She was on hydroxychloroquine, uh, 400 milligrams five days a week, 5.7 milligrams per kilo per day for 13 years, uh, also on prednisone. She was 20, 25. Uh, she's a very uh, thin lady at five foot four, 51 kilograms, which is why uh, even though she's only on the dose five days a week, she uh, is on a high dose uh, uh, greater than what's recommended uh, weekly. Uh, these are unfortunately Optos photos, so not as uh, sensitive. And I definitely recommend when doing autofluorescence to get, um, to get uh, 30 degree fields. Um, but uh, this is uh, what was done. And, and you can see that she has normal appearing retinas. There is some aberration there. And uh, you can see on the fundus autofluorescence, it's subtle, but you can see some hyper autofluorescence here uh, in the parafovia in kind of a circumlinear fashion. You also see it here, which corresponds to some of the uh, RP changes that you see uh, superior to the disc, unclear what the etiology of that is. Um, when we look at her fields, uh, it's the unfortunately we're unreliable. So there's a very high uh, number of false negatives, which make her field look worse than what it actually probably is, as well as fixation losses. Um, when looking at her uh, OCT, uh, when you look at an individual slice, oftentimes it's, it's difficult to pick things up, whether it's just changes in, in terms of the acquisition or whether they're true changes. So I, I definitely recommend everybody not just look at the one cut for 
platinal toxicity to actually scroll through the macular cube. Even the raster could potentially miss, the five-line raster could potentially miss areas of toxicity. So this is one patient population that I definitely would recommend uh, using the Zeiss Review software to scroll through the macular cube. When you look at this, you do see some subtle changes here, some granularity, and you may not be convinced, but when we uh, actually scroll through the slices and you come down, you see that that little attenuation, that granularity is actually present in every slice. Um, it's, and you can see that it's actually quite a subtle finding. Uh, so when we look at the other eye, again, you can start to see some, you know, some little bit of a darker area here at the RPE photoreceptor complex. And as we scroll through, again, it almost looks like it's kind of dipping down, but again, subtle if you follow uh, the ELM here, you can see uh, some change in uh, it kind of dipping down. And so this patient, just based on the OCT, the visual field and the history, I referred her for an ERG at, at Kensington and uh, her ERG was consistent with mild to moderate toxicity and her hydroxychloroquine was stopped. So she did have some risk factors, 5.7 milligrams per kilo per day. She mm -hmm. was on it for 13 years and what, did have renal disease and, and had started dialysis. So she certainly had risk factors for the development of hydroxychloroquine toxicity. But I, I give this case just to illustrate that the OCT findings uh, can be subtle at the beginning. And it's very important to, to really scroll through slowly and, and look at that area in the parafovia, look at the uh, photoreceptor RP area and see whether there's any changes and to obviously compare the two eyes uh, to ensure that it's whatever changes you see, they're almost always symmetric in hydroxychloroquine toxicity. So at this point, we're gonna change gears a little bit and we're very, very fortunate to have Dr. Kane speak to us about a, a hot topic uh, in, uh, in the media these days, uh, the use of hydroxychloroquine uh, as prophylaxis for healthcare workers. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin Kane is a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto and director of the Tropical Disease Unit at Toronto General Hospital. Uh, he's a prolific researcher and is the author of over 200 peer reviewed papers and is a world expert in translational research to address major global health threats, including malaria and HIV. Dr. Kane's efforts are focused on improving the health care of people worldwide by establishing global equity, knowledge sharing, and education. His work aims to allow for the transfer of appropriate technologies and training of research scientists in the developing world to enable and empower them to address their own problems in a sustainable fashion. Most recently, Dr. Kane is the co-PI of the Healthcare Workers Prophylaxis Trial, known as the HERO study, of which UHN is a site and will uh, investigate whether prophylactic hydroxychloroquine can protect essential frontline staff in the ER and ICU from COVID-19. We're eager to hear about your work in this clinical trial, and thank you for joining us. Please let me know uh, how to advance the slides. Okay, thanks very much, Spence. So just a little bit about, um, I mean, I'm a tropical global health person, so my relationship with these drugs is very much to treat malaria over decades. So just advance, please. Um, so this drug, um, can you just push, there we go. Yeah. This drug was, uh, you know, discovered in 1934. It's on the WHO list of the safest and most effective medications, which is actually a pretty short list. It's safe in all trimesters of pregnancy, um, and it's been used to protect pregnant women until recently when drug resistance and malaria made it less effective. Um, hydroxychloroquine, you all have much better personal experience with than I do, um, but generally is accepted to be better tolerated, has good tissue concentrations, including lung concentrations, uh, and can be used at a higher dose. Next slide, please. Just the next slide, please, thanks. So how might these drugs actually work on a viral infection? Well, I mean, you're very familiar with the immune modulatory effects, which is really thought to be mediated through the fact that it changes the pH, it, uh, it increases the pH in uh, intracellular organ, organelles, and that messes up the processing and secretion of a number of inflammatory mediators, such as IL-6 and TNF. Um, and this fits into this idea that severe COVID-19 is a cytokine storm model. Um, I'm not sure I buy that model, but that's, that's sort of the uh, hypothesis that's being pushed forward. The other, it has a number of antiviral activity mechanisms, which include al altering the glycosylation of ACE2, which is its viral receptor. And the pH changes um, that it induces intracellular may mess up the way the virus can process some of its proteins, 
uh, advanced one, please. And a really intriguing part is that it's been known for uh, almost a decade that if you can get zinc inside an infected cell, a cell that's infected with cor coronaviruses, it'll inhibit coronavirus replicase, which aptly named is the, the critical determinant of replication for that virus. Turns out um, that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are potent zinc ionophores, meaning they get zinc into a cell and therefore inhibit its replicase. Next slide, please. But the true mechanism of action, um, we've heard south of the border, uh, is a, a bunch of um, uncontrolled um, promotional aspects, particularly using hydroxychloroquine combined with azithromycin. And we'll come back to why that combination is particularly challenging from a safety point of view. Um, suffice it to say, the WHO, the CDC, the NIH, uh, aptly and appropriately states that there is no evidence that this drug works uh, in preventing or treating um, you know, uh, coronaviruses. Next slide, please. So our objective, and um, uh, Megan Landis, who's an emergency physician at UHN, is the co-PI in this, was to do a double-blind placebo-controlled um, RCT, randomized clinical trial, of um, hydroxychloroquine is pre-exposure prophylaxis, so PrEP. You've probably heard about a number of post-exposure. If you've contacted a case, uh, then trying, um, trying to sort of uh, give people drugs in, in a sort of a ring fashion to protect them. There's a lot of problems with that. Healthcare workers are gonna be at risk in the community, um, as well as at work. Uh, many patients or many infected patients are pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic, and it's not easy to do contract tracing. So the the advantage of this is it, it protects them in all environments, whether they're at work or not, whether there's a breach in PPE, et cetera. Um, so this is a study, uh, sample size is almost a thousand that is um, IRB approved, funded by the National Research Council and um, live now. So we're enrolling now. And the primary outcome will be rate of lab confirmed infections, uh, obviously between the hydroxychloroquine and placebo um, placebo recipients. So we hope to have an interim analysis within about three months. And I think if we have good evidence that it works, it could be scaled to other uh, important frontline workers, ICU, uh, first responders, EMS, etc. But we're just trying to get some, some evidence that it works. Next slide, please. Um, you've heard a lot about safety issues. I just want to put that in context. If you can hit, the, hit it again, advance it again, please. So um, this was one study. None of these studies are actually peer reviewed, as you know. They're all just out there. But there was a study that just um, came out as a preprint, although not peer reviewed yesterday, uh, in Brazil, where the sample size was meant to be 440, but they stopped at 81 because of QTC prolongation in about 25%. And a, and a trend to higher case fatality rates. These were admitted um, ill patients. But if you look at the doses, you may appreciate these doses, 12,000 milligrams of base, which is equivalent to 18,000 milligrams of salt, um, was the high dose, and it was observed in that group. The low dose was 2,700 milligrams of base. Um, and I'll come back to this base and salt because it's, it's, a, it's a, a weird, uh, relationship with tropical disease meds and can be very confusing and people can overdose simply because they don't realize they're giving a base or salt dose, which can be too high or too low. The bottom line though, these doses, even the low dose is twice as high and the high dose is eight times higher than any treatment that we would use for malaria. In addition, all the patients in that study leave, uh, received azithromycin and ceftriaxone and somewhere on oseltamivir, all of those drugs can affect QTC. So I think the, um, the concerns about cardiac issues are real if you overdose and use them in the presence of other QT altering drugs. Next slide, please. The last thing I'm going to mention is just another study that we have up and running. Um, and this is a CIHR funded study with a co-PIs, um, our Shaf, um, Kashav G um, and Shahad Hussain, uh, along with myself. And it's to I mean, the majority of people that present with, with COVID-19 um, are going to have an uncomplicated and, and self-limited course. Um, and they don't necessarily need to be admitted or managed, but it can be very difficult when you first see them to know who that person is that will deteriorate over the next week. 
So this is a study on et cetera, enhanced triage COVID, which uses some, some very interesting immune and endothelial activation markers to predict who will deteriorate over the next week. Right now, we're, we're doing this as an observational study, then real time, and commercial partners are making a point of care test. So those, that's one other study that you may be interested in. It's already approved and is already also enrolling. So that's, that's what I have. Thank you, Panos. Thank you so much. I think uh, there's a question from the audience, uh, Dr. Rai. Yeah, so this is, I guess, a question for Dr. Kane. Um, and this has to do with combining zinc supplementation with hydroxychloroquine for treatment. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so zinc is very tightly regulated. I mean, obviously, it's something we do need in our diet, but getting zinc into a cell is tightly regulated. So, you know, swallowing, you know, a lot of zinc uh, orally is really not going to make any difference to intracellular zinc in infected cells in the respiratory tract. So that's why a zinc ionophore would make a difference. I think you don't need to be um, taking excessive zinc orally. You just don't want to be deficient. Um, so normal dietary intakes would be sufficient to get these zinc levels um, available to be taken into an infected cell. Okay, great. And I just want to clarify that um, the dose that's being used in the, uh, the HERO trial is 400 milligrams daily. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so and in, in, in we'd all agree that at 400 milligrams daily for a short period over uh, three months, that there's virtually no risk of, of, of retinal toxicity uh, at that dose. Okay, so we'll continue. We're gonna, we have some great questions, which we're going to address at the end through the panel. We just have to get through a couple more cases. Um, this is a 72-year-old lady who was referred to me for screening. Uh, she has a history of macular degeneration, which had been noted about eight years prior at her five-year follow-up. Uh, she had been on 400 milligrams a day, uh, or 5.6 milligrams per kilo per day for 10 years, and she's a non-smoker. Uh, she's 20-25 in both eyes, 5 foot 5, 71 kilograms. And uh, if you look at her OCT, I just want to point one thing out. So you can see between uh, these red arrows that there is some uh, attenuation of, again, that ellipsoid zone we were talking about. But you'll also notice that there's drusen. So the area where there's uh, the blue arrow, you can see a drusen, and, and actually here, you can also see a druse. And this patient had some subtle pigmentary changes clinically as well that were consistent with her macular degeneration. Um, if you look at her other eye, it, it looks relatively normal. Um, and uh, other than she also has some diabetic retinopathy, you can see some uh, microaneurysms here and a little bit of uh, trace uh, uh, associated cysts with that. Um, so it really leads the question of, of what to do with these patients. So she, of course, complicates things with, with unreliable fields in both eyes. Um, and the question is, is what would you do with this patient? There's no overt signs of toxicity, but um, what would people recommend doing? Continue the medication, uh, stop the medication, follow more frequently or order additional testing or refer to a retina specialist. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll there. We're getting some pretty good responses. So the majority of people said unclear whether toxicity follow more frequently or order additional testing, which, which I think is a, a great approach and is what I did. Uh, this patient really wanted to be on uh, this medication. They had previously been on methotrexate and did not tolerate it. Um, and uh, she had no side effects. And, even the thought of stopping her hydroxychloroquine had her uh, quite upset. So um, it's, it's important to speak to the patient because some patients may say, well, you know, I'd rather just stop it. I don't really know. I haven't I've been on it for so long. I haven't really noticed. Uh, I haven't had any symptoms. I'd be willing to try that. Other patients say, you know, nothing else has worked. I really want to continue it. So I think uh, talking to the patient is important. Um, but my approach in these cases is, uh, is to get additional screening. So this is a great patient to get a multifocal ERG on because multifocal ERGs, as we discussed, is quite sensitive. Um, and if a patient has normal multifocal ERG in these cases, you could feel reassured to continue the medication. Um, arranging more frequent follow-ups, seeing them at six months, I think is quite reasonable. Um, and then considering also a fundus autofluorescence as well, although that could be affected by macular pathology like macular degeneration. So um, 
when people ask, is macular degeneration or macular pathology a uh, contraindication? Well, the good news is that most people uh, that are on hydroxychloroquine uh, often don't have macular degeneration. They're younger patients that have lupus. Um, a lot of the patients that uh, have rheumatoid arthritis have been transitioned to biologics. Uh, although there are cases in which you do have patients with macular degeneration. And in those cases, I think it's important uh, to follow them a little bit more frequently. I wouldn't say it's an absolute contraindication to use unless they have such significant RP changes that, your, that toxicity would be indistinguishable. So I think a case by case basis is how things should be taken. So Panos, in those cases, how do you adjust either your dose or your frequency of follow-up? So, um, so for this patient, uh, the first day we met, she was, I think, at 5.7 milligrams per kilo. Uh, I spoke with her rheumatologist. They wanted to continue the medication. Uh, it was reduced to 4.5 milligrams per kilo per day. She had a multifocal ERG within three months, which was normal and reassuring. And I followed her at a six-month interval. I saw her back once at six months, and there was no uh, uh, changes. Uh, and so she's continuing on the same dose. Now, it is controversial because some people will argue that um, people that have any form of RP changes due to macular degeneration uh, uh, may be at higher risk of toxicity simply because uh, their RP is already uh, affected. And so you have to be careful in these cases. And so I, I definitely would rec uh, recommend people be cautious uh, and, uh, and, and use ancillary testing, follow people closer and ensure that they're properly uh, dosed. So this case here is a 50 year old gentleman referred for toxicity. Um, he had lupus for 27 years, also psoriasis and, and a marginal cell lymphoma of the product. Um, he was on hydroxychloroquine 400 milligrams for 15 years, uh, but again, had reduced renal function due to his lupus um, and presented to me actually quite symptomatic saying uh, that his vision was just diffusely blurry. Um, when you look at his dose adjustment, he was at 5.1 milligrams for his uh, absolute body weight and 5.6 for ideal body weight. So it seems reasonably that he was dosed reasonably well. He unfortunately had not had an eye exam for eight years, uh, which is another thing to just remember. People come back every year and after a little while, after their 15th year, they may say, you know, I've never had a problem. Why am I, why am I going back every year and waiting two and a half hours and leaving dilated and all that? So at the end of every visit, I, I tell people you don't have toxicity now, but as we know, this happens over time. It's important to come back every year, uh, even if things are okay. And I just emphasize that and he's a great example why. Uh, so you could see here, he's uh, got some core retinal atrophy around the optic nerve, which is unrelated as well as some peripheral core retinal atrophy, but you can see uh, quite a bit of modeling of, of the uh, macular area. And when we look at his autofluorescence, you can see a ring of hyper uh, autofluorescence around centrally here in both eyes. And these are his visual fields. So this is his 10-2. So you could see a severe ring scotoma uh, here in both eyes. His OCT, you can see complete loss of the RP uh, photoreceptor complex beyond the central area, which again corresponds to that three to, three to four degrees of field that he has remaining. And he also has some cystoid changes overlying. And again here, some cystoid changes here overlying. And complete loss of the uh, photoreceptor RP ellipsoid zone here extending out. 30-2 shows that he does have some, some uh, preserved peripheral vision, again, uh, emphasizing that uh, hydroxychloroquine toxicity preferentially affects the macula. And uh, the medication was stopped. Uh, he had a multifocal ERG, which was not measurable above noise in either eye. His full field ERG uh, showed diminished photopic and scotopic responses, but from his visual field, we could see that he did have a peripheral visual function. This is convinced, consistent with advanced toxicity and, and definitely an unfortunate case uh, where the patient is quite uh, visually disabled uh, and, and mostly from uh, those seven years in which he wasn't, uh, he wasn't screened. It carries a poor prognosis. We know that in advanced hydroxychloroquine toxicity, it can oftentimes progress over time even after stopping. And that's not surprising, just like in macular degeneration, when people start to develop RPE changes and uh, geographic atrophy, it tends to expand at a, a constant rate over time. So this is the final case. Um, it's a 63 year old lady who was referred for a second opinion regarding hydroxychloroquine toxicity. Uh, she had been diagnosed about six months prior she had a liver transplant 25 years ago, presumed autoimmune. She had chronic renal insufficiency with a creatinine of 150. 
um, as well as hypertension, RA, and gout. So she has pretty significant rheum uh, rheumatologic disease, both having a presumed autoimmune hepatic failure as well as rheumatoid arthritis. She was on 400 milligrams a day, which is, uh, she was a, a larger lady, so that corresponded to 4.7 milligrams per kilo per day, absolute body weight for 3.5 years. She was also on my for her um, uh, kidney, uh, sorry, for her renal uh, hepatic transplant. She's a non-smoker, no family history of eye disease. She was 20, 25, and 20, 30 with no visual field on confrontation, 86 kilograms as we discussed. And this is her uh, photo. So you can see here that uh, there's quite a bit of sheathing of the arteries uh, here that you can appreciate. The optic nerve looks healthy. The macula, you know, possibly some early pigmentary changes, but hard to tell. This is her fundus autofluorescence. You can see uh, kind of uh, hypo uh, uh, autofluorescence that's extending outside of the macular area in both eyes. The actual paraphobia looks relatively uh, unremarkable. And this is her OCT. So you can see here um, that there is complete loss of the ellipsoid zone uh, uh, extending outwards, uh, beginning at the paraphobia. And there's a small overlying epiretinal membrane there. These are her visual fields. So these are her 30-2 visual fields. And uh, her 10-2 showed uh, uh, only two preserved points centrally. And again, that's what we're seeing here on uh, her 30-2. This is her uh, uh, Optos photos in both eyes. And her autofluorescence in both eyes. And the electroretinogram shows undetectable responses on multifocal ERG and full field ERG. So here's a question for the audience. Given these findings would be your next course of action, diagnose advanced toxicity, stop the medication, B, perform additional workup, C, not sure, refer to retina. So most people, again, think there's advanced toxicity. Um, some people say a new workup, uh, additional workup, and some say refer to retina. So let me just close this. So there were a few things about this case that just didn't sit well with me. The first was the toxicity was really out of proportion to the duration of use. She had only been on it for four years uh, and was on a dose less than five milligrams per kilo per day and she had, has an undetectable ERG. The second thing is, is that there's actually central sparing, especially on autofluorescence. So her peripheral retina tends to be actually more affected than her central retina. The last thing is that she had this arterial or sheathing, which again is, is very unusual uh, in any patient. Uh, she does have a strong history of autoimmune disease. So uh, we pursued additional investigations, uh, got an IVFA, which again, you can see here has uh, a small amount of late leakage uh, along the arcades, as well as some very mild uh, small vessel vasculitis. Same in the uh, other eye. And so this, putting everything together, the uh, constellation of findings is very suspicious for autoimmune retinopathy. Um, so this patient does have autoimmune retinopathy. Uh, there are two types, there's perineoplastic and non-perineoplastic. Um, she had a full cancer workup, which was normal. So she was diagnosed uh, with non-perineoplastic autoimmune retinopathy. Um, she was already on my fortic, so I started her on oral prednisone with a taper over three months and liaison with her rheumatologist, to, and we agreed to start a second steroid sparing agent given the progress occurred over a two-year period. So at her baseline exam uh, for uh, Plaquenil, she actually had normal function, normal visual field, uh, and uh, this was all uh, had occurred over the past two years, and she was started on uh, Humira every two weeks. She initially did very well, and then six months later, she presented with um, severe cystoid macular edema in the left eye, moderate uh, macular edema in the right eye, um, implanted Osridex in both eyes, and uh, it responded quite well. Uh, she's now received, uh, she gets Osridex every four to five months, and thankfully has, her, her vision has been stable at 2025 and 2030, although she is developing some PSC cataract. So, um, this is a, an example just to always uh, beware of masquerades uh, in these cases. So if, if it doesn't make sense, if, if you're seeing patients that have toxicity that you wouldn't expect to have toxicity given the duration of use, 
to, uh, given the clinical findings and ancillary testing, it's always important to think of certain things. And in this next slide, I'm just going to show three OCTs. Uh, these are all patients uh, of mine who have findings that one could convince themselves is, is uh, um, hydroxychloroquine toxicity. Here in this top one, you can see um, some uh, changes here, uh, although the unusual thing is that it actually extends subfovially, which would be unusual for hydroxychloroquine toxicity. Here you see a loss again between here and here of that ellipsoid zone. Um, and then here you see a patient with some drusen. So the first patient is a patient with macular tail injectasia. Uh, it was asymmetric. The other eye has the more classic findings of uh, inner retinal cavitations and overlying ILM drape, uh, as well as uh, crystals seen on clinical exam. The second patient is, a, is, a, is another uh, patient with hydroxychloroquine toxicity, uh, a middle-aged uh, woman with lupus. Uh, and then this third one is, is a patient who uh, also has macular degeneration. So uh, always uh, use your ancillary testing. OCT is a great tech, uh, technology, which allows us to detect hydroxychloroquine toxicity very early, uh, but no one test should be used on its own. We should, you should use your whole armamentarium, uh, including some of the ancillary testing that we discussed. So the take home points are, Five milligram per kilogram per day of real body weight dosing is what is recommended in the new guidelines. But in short or obese patients, I do think it's worth considering uh, at least calculating ideal body weight and making sure that they're below that 6.5 milligram per kilo per day of the previous guidelines and dose adjusting. Of course, talking with the rheumatologist, I can't emphasize, it's very, very important. There's a reason why people are on the dose that they're on. And uh, it's always important to liaison and to, to learn more about why the patients on a higher dose and whether there's uh, any way that they can continue on the medication at a lower dose without uh, sacrificing uh, any benefits they've gained from a rheumatologic perspective. Toxicity is dose and duration dependent. Uh, beware in patients with reduced renal function uh, or hepatic function given that it's metabolized through the liver uh, or on tamoxifen uh, due to uh, concomitant toxicity. Uh, the guidelines is to do a baseline screen and then screen annually after five years with one subjective and one objective test. And then when in doubt, if something is, is, doesn't seem right, it seems like an unusual case, uh, always ask for a second opinion. And I do that as well. So I'll leave you with this last diagram, which I think is probably the take home point because it really just emphasizes how important it is for people to be properly dosed. Uh, I will give the disclaimer that I think that these rates are much higher than what my experience is clinically and as well as uh, Dr. Easterbrook and I think most rheumatologists, uh, but it is, uh, in, in, I think it's partly because of some selection bias in terms of dropout bias and people uh, uh, that are recruited to the study and that have diagnostic testing oftentimes my issue with the study was when it was performed, OCT was not readily available. So perhaps uh, OCT was being done and people were being referred to centers that were at higher risk for having developed, uh, for developing toxicity or were on higher doses. And that's why we have an artificially elevated risk of retinopathy. Thank you. And uh, now we'll uh, have a panel discussion to answer some of the questions which have been posed in the chat. All right, well, thank you to panels and Dr. Kane and Dr. Corette. Uh, and Dr. Easterbrook for this wonderful talk. There's a number of questions here. Um, I'll start off with a simple one for, for Panos. Panos, how do you um, suggest we calculate ideal body weight? So with ideal body weight, there are, uh, there are different nomograms, which basically look at height, uh, the height of the patient, as well as their gender. Uh, there's NIH formulas, there's a Michelady's equation. They're all pretty similar. If you look at the nomograms, uh, there's a website that you can actually type in uh, their, uh, their uh, height, their weight, and uh, their gender, and it will provide you with ideal body weight through that. All right, thank you. So we've got a couple of questions here for Dr. Kane. Uh, a lot of interest in this HERO study. Um, so I guess the first question is, some ophthalmologists in the U.S. are using a prophylactic dose of 400 milligrams for three days, then 200 or 400 milligrams weekly, um, how was the hero dose determined and what do you think of people using prophylactic um, plaquenil at this stage? Is that in the context of a study or was that just off-label use, which I know is no, not... I, th I think this is off-label use that they're describing. 
I mean, I think we came up with a dose that we thought was going to give us the least amount of potential adverse events, um, but therapeutically made sense based on some pharmacologic and pharmacokinetic modeling that was published in Clinical Infectious Disease in February. That was the dose that they thought would give the best long penetration and the best distribution with the least potential for adverse events. Okay, thank you. And one more question for you. Interesting question. Uh, do we have any data on COVID outcomes in patients who are already taking hydroxychloroquine for lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or any other condition? Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question and of great interest. Um, I think it'll take uh, um, maybe an, an ISIS type approach, a large database approach to look at those relationships uh, in large enough numbers over time, like a big, big data analysis. So right now, I haven't seen any data that's linked them, but it's, but it's, it's a great question. Okay, uh, question for, for Dr. Easterbrook. There's a couple of people here who've asked about uh, annual follow-up in the first five years, perhaps because the patient's requesting it or uh, the rheumatologist is requesting it. If a patient's asking for annual follow-up, do you, do you do that or do you wait for the five-year mark to start annual checks? Well, the problem in the past is the, if you only see them every five years, they get lost and the rheumatologists want them seen more often because suddenly they just turn up as you mentioned in one of the cases. So I think they should be seen once in that five year period, but they've got, you've got to keep track of them because every now and then, as you saw, they come in diagnosed and they've not seen anybody for years. Okay, um, and a question for, for Dr. Easterbrook and Dr. Christakis, pretty interesting question that they have here. So they've got a patient with rheumatoid arthritis and kidney disease who's been on hydroxychloroquine for about 15 years. The ophthalmologist does suspect toxicity based on the field and the fundus appearance, but the patient has had two normal multifocal ERGs. Could this still be toxicity? Um, the patient obviously does not want to stop taking Plaquenil. I guess they're, they're getting good benefit from it. So what would you do in a case of suspected toxicity, but the multifocal ERG is reassuring? And uh... Are the fields absolutely normal? Good, reliable person? Let's say yes. That's the information I have. That's difficult. I guess I'd see them more frequently, but in the absence of... Sorry, the, the fields are not normal. I'm sorry. The, the, based on the field and the fund, if they think there is toxicity, it's the ERG that's normal. Well, that's something we don't know. Uh, Panos, uh, this is what these... I, I think ERG... I think this is an interesting case because if a patient has... Um, changes on their fundus appearance, that's a pretty late sign of, of toxicity. Um, so it'd be very unusual to have a change on your uh, uh, fundus exam and have a normal OCT and have a normal multifocal ERG. Um, I think in this case, with multifocal ERG being a sensitive uh, medication, and it says the patient was very upset, did not want to stop uh, the medication, I'd be very interested to know what the OCT shows. Um, OCT is a very good structural indicator of function. Uh, so if they have an abnormal visual field, it should correspond to some change uh, structurally on OCT. Uh, I, I don't think that toxicity is something that if this patient's been on it for 15 years, if you repeat the testing in a couple of months, I don't think that there will be any progression. Uh, I think this would be a very this would be very unusual because multifocal ERG is actually found, as Dr. Easterbrook alluded to before, to actually be more sensitive than, than the other testing. And in fact, oftentimes we'll see changes on multifocal ERG with normal visual fields and normal um, OCTs. So this is a little bit of the reverse. In this patient, I would definitely recommend looking very carefully at the OCT to see if there's any structural change. Repeat the visual field because visual field you know, can change over time. And I think it often takes patients time to get um, accustomed to doing them and not having fixation losses and not feeling you know, too worried to push the button. Uh, so I would, I would follow this patient very closely and repeat the testing, but it, it would be a little bit of an unusual case. You'd want to make sure that you're not uh, missing something else. Okay, and there's been a couple questions about some uh, older tests such as home Amsler or color vision, which is relatively easily done in the clinic. Is there any role for these tests at this point? Well, it's interesting if you have somebody who is symptomatic, like your first patient panels, they have absolute scotomas or very deep scotomas. And if their color vision is down, these patients have moderate and two thirds of them will progress over time. 
If you have patients who have shall, asymptomatic patients with normal color, with uh, shallow, small scotomas, they will not progress. And I've had several patients who've said, cut the dose in half, but I'm not going off this drug. It is too important for me. So the, the color vision is useful in that when we have a patient like that, we bring them to, to see the residents. And if you can't do your color vision test as fast as the observer can, then you have moderate retinopathy. So I don't think it's a good diagnostic test, but it's an interesting test. I, ju I just looked at the chat. There's a little update from the last question. So the visual fields were normal, were not normal, and they were reliable. And the OCT was also abnormal. So if you have an abnormal OCT with a appearance that's consistent with hydroxychloroquine toxicity, and it corresponds to the visual field, which is also abnormal, I would stop the medication in this patient. Uh, because the guidelines look, if you have both one objective and uh, one subjective or one structural and one functional uh, test that's abnormal, a multifocal ERG is not, is not required uh, for the diagnosis. In this case, with the patient uh, having been on it for 15 years and it said that she'd be upset to stop it, this would be a great case to have a second opinion. I'd recommend sending it to a colleague for a second opinion. Uh, but my recommendation, just based on this information, abnormal OCT with findings characteristic of toxicity uh, corresponding to a visual field with a history of 15 years of use and someone with renal uh, failure, I would have a very serious conversation with both the rheumatologist and the patient because that's very suspicious for toxicity. Uh, and it is unusual that the multifocal ERG is, is uh, abnormal, but I don't think a multifocal ERG um, is, is necessary to diagnose toxicity. Thank you, panel. Okay, Very clear answer there. There's one more question on multifocal ERGs. Would you, do you get them routinely as baseline when starting Pocanol? So, so I personally don't. Uh, I get multifocal ERGs if uh, I don't use it as a basic screening test. I will only get it if there's, uh, if I suspect toxicity or if a patient has findings which preclude screening like macular degeneration, um, uh, where I'm not 100% sure. So I use it as a, as a kind of a diagnostic tool, but I tend not to get it uh, at baseline. But there obviously is reasons to get it at baseline um, in certain patients. And uh, it's very interesting from a research perspective to have that available. We are doing the study where we're trying to get patients uh, just before they go on the drug after diagnosis to see how sensitive and specific the multifocal is for questions like we just had with that interesting, <clears throat> interesting case. So I, I don't think it's necessary for baseline, but we are trying to do this study. And uh, if you know patients that, or the rheumatologist particularly, if they can let us see them quickly, we'll give them a multifocal, but I don't think it should be a routine baseline. We have two questions here on visual fields that I'll also uh, address. So one is talking about whether a visual field 24-2C for plaque mold toxicity instead of a 10-2. And another is looking at, uh, for patients uh, that are Asian, uh, a, a, a visual field that looks at points closer to the center than a typical 30-2, but also has the peripheral uh, uh, points. So in patients that uh, are Asian, I'd recommend doing both a 10-2 and a 24-2. I think 30-2s, although they do provide some additional points, they do take longer. And I think there is an element of test fatigue. Uh, but I would recommend getting two visual fields in people uh, that, are, uh, uh, that are Asian, um, because I don't think that the 24-2 or 30-2 uh, would be sufficiently sensitive to pick up paracentral change to have fewer points. Um, in terms of the 24-2C, I'm not sure I could uh, comment on that for all patients. I think the guidelines would, would recommend doing a 10-2 uh, uh, on, on all patients. Okay, thank you, Panos. Um, I wanna thank you for a great round. And I wanted to remind the audience about next week, uh, we have Rajiv Mooney speaking on the evolution of retinal detachment repair. And going forward, we will be posting the Zoom links directly on the Department of Ophthalmology website, so you can access the links there as well as through the listservs. And I'm going to ask John to close out our meeting. Yes. So uh, thank you once again to all our panelists, Dr. Christakis, Easterbrook, Karet, and Kane. Here's hoping that Dr. Kane's hero study uh, shows something positive and helpful in this. Uh, in
time. And a final thank you to M&D for, uh, again, spearheading and getting these Zoom rounds off the ground. I'd never even heard of Zoom uh, three weeks ago, and uh, here we are with uh, hundreds of ophthalmologists and, and other uh, ophthalmic personnel across the country joining in. So uh, once again, thank you, and uh, have a good weekend. And thank you to all our thank panelists. You. Thank you to the panel. Thank you. Thank you.